dedicate uh, this uh, lecture to you uh, and pray together with you for the security, the safety of Medinat Israel. Uh, our enemies are looking for ways to hurt us, to destroy us, and they are very creative. You know, Israel is very creative in saving lives. In, uh, um, developing new things, how to save people in earthquakes, how to save, you know, to develop new medicines. And our enemies, they are very creative in knowing how to kill us here. As we speak, there are many, many, many fires going on in Israel, unfortunately. And it's not just uh, material uh, loss, it's, uh, it's getting also to be a threat to many, many lives because it's going all around. And this is not just a, a fire that happened by, by, by mistake. So I'm trying to go around and to uh, bring security and to be Shomer Israel and go around and be keeping uh, Am Israel together and uh, in good shape. All right. So the, the title is how to keep our marriage strong, right? And, and I want to I, I add something more. How to keep this strong and how to protect our message. Good? Right? So we're going to talk about these two things. So, number one, let me ask you a question. This is a kind of a rhetorical question, but you can participate too. Who do you think has a stronger bond as a couple? A couple that has problems or a couple that doesn't have problems? Can you see my, my question? Who do you think has a Stronger bond. With problems? With problems or without problems? Okay, if you just got this clear, then I can go. Because you understood the main thing. This is one of the uh, consequences, consequences that we are not looking for, of course, involuntary consequences. So, something called affluenza. You know what affluenza means? Affluenza means that Baruch Hashem, most of us are wealthy, most of us are healthy. I'm not saying that we all drive a Telsa or something like that, you don't need to be wealthy, right? but we all have food, we all have a, a ceiling, we all have you know, a cell phone and a car, right? Am I right? We all have something to protect ourselves from coal, so we, we are all rich just for having that. We have a refrigerator at home. <coughs> so we are very, very affluent. And Baruch Hashem, most of all, Baruch Hashem, we're healthy. Sometimes you have a problem here or there. But the thing is that many times, you know, I see, I, I see couples, I see a lot of couples, and they come with problems. When you scratch a little bit, you see that they have only one problem. They are the problem. <laughs> because they don't have real problems. They don't have real problems of health, of parnasa, or accident, or anything that unfortunately many people suffer. Okay, so this is the the um, is ironic because from the point of view of the strength of the couple, ironically, ironically, the more pro real problems they face, the stronger the bond, and sometimes vice versa. Why this happens? Why this happened and why this should not happen? Because I believe that we might have. Should we go up the downstairs again? <laughs> <laughs> why this happened? I, I think that it's a matter of priorities. Mental priorities. What does it mean, mental priorities? Mental priorities means that we, as Jewish people, we have to, like, we have. In our minds, three cabinets, all right? So the first cabinet is the most important thing in life. What should we have as Jews when we say the most important thing, thing in life? What? You tell me. Hashem, Hashem created me for a purpose, right? He wants something from me. I'm not here as a chimpanzee, the grandson of a chimpanzee. He created me for something. I have to get close to him. That's the, this is 
the mission of my life. This is how it should be. So this should be the most important thing. Then you have important matters. Take care of your money, take care of your health, take care of this, take care of that. All right? And then you have non-important things. What she said about me, what she said, what I said about her, the food that she gave me, this, that, how she reacted to what I said. That is terrible. Right? Now, if we don't have Boreola was the first priority, actively, not theoretically, actively, I hope you understand the difference. Then the second cabinet takes over the first. And there is health and parnasa. But if health and parnasa are covered, then what takes over the first cabinet? You tell me. You understand what I'm saying? The, the pitiness, these small things, what she said, what I said, how she react. What about the gifts? What about this? What about... This takes over to the first cabinet. And this is where problems are. Now, when you have a couple that they have real parnasa problems, or has special health problems, that goes to the first cabinet, even if they don't have bore olam. But we as Jews, listen, when you got married, where did you get married? In front of whom you get married? You got married. How many people or how many entities are in your couple? Please don't tell me two. If you think that you are two, you are wrong. You just began with the wrong premise. It's not you and your husband. A Jewish marriage means, a Jewish couple means. Go ahead. Bore Olam, my wife, and me. That's it. We are three. We are always three. You know, Mr. Vasalia said so many times this beautiful thing, Mr. Rabbi Chaim, so many times. And everybody knows it, but we don't have it in mind. Maybe because it's, we heard it so many times. Ish Isha, you remember this? Ish Isha, the you and the hey. When Borei Olam is there, everything is solved. If Borei Olam is not there, Esh Ochalat, and then, then, then small things become important. And everything is, we, we can destroy our, our marriage, our peace. If we don't have our priorities right. I think this, it begins and ends there. Right? This is what strengthens our marriage. When we have Boreolam in mind, because when you have Boreolam in mind, you can let go easier. You can let go. Because you say, ah, oh, this belongs to the third cabinet. Uh, it's okay, let go. Let, it, let pass. All right? And you are more humble. If, if you have Boreolam in mind, it will not destroy your self esteem if you say to your wife or to your husband, I'm sorry, even if you think you were right. Understand? So, having Boreo Olam as the third partner in this society, or the first, in this society we call marriage, is number one and also number ten. If there are ten things, it's number one and number ten. It's the first and the last. All right? Is that clear? We need Hashem. We need Hashem more than ever. Okay? All right. Uh, just, just a practical idea I want to give you. The, the problem with Emunah, our problem with Emunah is that we know that Hashem exists, but we keep forgetting about it. We, we don't live it. Now, at least in terms of our relationship with our wife, with our spouse, with our husband, we have to remember Him all the time. The secret I want to share with you how do you remind yourself of Borei Olam? Use the mezuzah. This is what the mezuzah is for. You heard the Chachamim say, mezuzah. what does the mezuzah do? Protects. protects you. What better protection we need than being reminder that Borei Olam is part of our marriage, is part of our family. If I debate with my wife and disagree with my, discuss with my wife, 
Yeah, should I give my parents this? Should I give your parents? Look, I remember, Moreno is there. He, gave, he, he told us something he wouldn't buy him, for example. Then everything is solved. Then the debate between my wife and I, you know, let's refer it to Borreo and let's see what he wants. Let's see what he wishes. And then the issue is solved, completely solved. You see, so I told you two things. First, that there are some disadvantages, ironically, in living in a society with so much affluence, with so little real problems, okay? My, my wife told me this, that, uh, you know, she, uh, she finished uh, her certificate in, a, in a couples marriage and family counseling in Israel, in an institution that was conceived by the Rabbinate of Israel, the Rabbinate of Israel, Israel, they conceived of, of this institution, Yanar, because they saw that the divorces were for nothing, were for things that were very small, were not justified. It's not the big two, there are two big issues in divorce, as we shall infidelity or, or physical violence or tremendous verbal abuse, but all the rest, oh, I don't, we don't get along, we don't understand each other, it's, you know, you can work that out, you understand? But people prefer to divorce. I know that this is not a problem here, but still the problem is there, that we fight, couples fight, and I see this every single day, couples fight and for nothing, really for small things, okay? Is that clear? When we have Borea Olam in the equation, everything goes boom. Small things, they go, they go down. If we don't have Borea Olam in the equation, small things become now problems. All right? That's number one. Number two, we need to accept. There are two ways of dealing with your spouse when you have a difference with your spouse. One way is you work on her. You work on him. You understand? For me now, my wife is going to be my project. I'm going to change her. There, is, there are many things wrong in what she does. I'm going to change her. Or my husband, you know, he's so, uh, you know, uncommunicative. Or he's so this, or he's so that. He doesn't reason, he doesn't understand. I'm going to change him. That is the formula for disaster. What you need to do is to work on yourself. Then marriage is perfect. All right? And on this, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, it takes two to tango, but incredibly, it takes only one to fix a marriage. Do you understand what I said? It's so important. This is so important. Acceptance. I accept my wife. You accept your husband. As he is, as she is. As he. Imagine, just, just this is theory, okay? Imagine I have a forgetful wife. I'm not, but imagine I have a forgetful wife. Or ADD wife. So she always forgets things and things that relate to me, could be related to me, you know, very, very important things. Somebody called me from the office and, and it, it, it leaves a, a message and, and then she forgets to tell me this message. That I have to be at 8 today at night in the office ah, or something like that. Or, 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 or the mail or the bills, you know. Uh, you get the bill, and then, oh, she, she forgot to, to give you the bill. And then they, they turn off your electricity. That's it. They cut your, your power. Because your wife forgot. Or your wife forgets that she has a doctor appointment for your children. So, normally, what would a man do? I'm just saying a man, but it could be the opposite, okay? What would a man do in that situation, normally? What do you think he would do? He 
would say, listen, a loving husband would say, well, there is a problem here. And I have to fix it. I have to work on her. I'm talking about a loving husband, all right? I have to work on her. I have to help her. So this is what he does. He, he brings a, a board and writes down all the time and, and keeps telling her, please write down every day what you have to do. And he, he brings some special mail box for her, etc., uh, etc., et with the hope that she will understand. And, and he also tells her every single day, listen, you are not a child. You have to be a responsible person. You are an adult. And, and by the way, in this scenario, who is right? Seriously, who is right? No, come on. No, I think there is right or wrong here. I think there is right or wrong here. And that's, that's, a, that's a key question. That's a key question. Who is right? Can we assume that the husband is right? That you have to be a responsible adult? And I want to show you, not just who is right, I want to show you how to deal with your spouse when you think you are right. You got it? Now, in these circumstances, when you think or you know that you are right, still, you cannot work on her. Because it's going to destroy your relationship. Because it is very difficult for people to change. And especially difficult if you want to change them. There is, there is more resistant, resistance to change when somebody else tells you. You understand what I'm saying? Hakamim said this, the sahar, the reward of the person that has the obligation to do the mitzvah is greater than when a person does the mitzvah without being obligated. It should be the opposite. But why? Because I, I have a command to put the in. So you know, I have to resist my own ego. No, no, I'm in charge of my life. Why somebody else has to tell me what to do? Why if I say, I don't have to put, I want to put the in, then my reward is less. You know? So this resistance is there when, when I try to fix my wife. I have to, I try to fix my spouse, even though I'm right. There's only one thing I can do. Only one thing I can do. All my bills online. No more bills in the mail. I will never, ever give my, my home phone number to anyone. I have only one number. And this is my cell phone, you understand? And, 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 and the doctors, I will call every doctor there. Please send me a notification. Whenever you have, uh, you know, an appointment, and I take care of it. Is that fair? Is that fair? I am doing what right now? I'm doing her job. I'm doing double work. And, and I'm right. You got it? Now, what do you think I have to do? Which way will work better? Me telling my wife every single day we have a reason to lecture her and tell her, how did you forget? And how to be responsible? There are people that this is their life every single day. They spend all their day just blah, 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 in one way or another. So not only that I probably one changer, I will hurt my relationship with my wife. While if I accept her as she is, with her flaws, and I work to adapt myself to her, then, is there a hope for this couple? Yes. You see? So, it takes two to tango. But it takes one for Shalom Bayit. <laughs> Just one person. I know you think, well, why, why should I do everything? But isn't that what love means? Right? 
So you have to recognize your spouse flaws. And I'm not talking about terrible flaws, all right? I, I gave you uh, not such a dramatic example. Is that clear? I'm not talking about terrible things, okay? But just normal flaws, things of character. Have to recognize them, accept them, and not to work on my wife to change her. If anything, work on myself to accept my, my wife. Love, or one of the best levels or the highest levels of love, is what? Acceptance, right? I have to accept my wife, my spouse, as it is. Again, I say my wife, but you, you know, it uh, goes both ways. Um, I, you know, I, I give workshops exactly for this point, that there are so many differences between men and women. You know, you know my work, right? You, you, most of you have been there, except those who are single. So I'm looking forward, as I said, for you, and for, and for you, and for all the rest. Uh, uh, in, in that workshop, I, I talk about differences in communication, the way women talk, the way women expect to be understood, the way, the way men talk, the way men convey a message. It's completely different the way men relax from stress, the way women relax from stress. If we don't know all these things, we cannot accept, right? If you know these things, you are playing already with, with advantage. How do you say, how did the Torah say the first time Adam and Eve were together? Be Adam, yada et havaishto. Knowledge. Knowledge is essential for, for love. So you have to know who you are, where you're coming from, right? Once I know, I have to accept. And as I said before, sometimes you have a couple. Many times I have couples with these differences. You know, and, and it, it was like irreconcilable because they didn't have a real problem. They just were clashing the whole time. And I, I talked to them separately. You know what? Hey, you, the husband, you have to accept your wife as she is. And I tell her how women are. And, your wife is a normal girl. And then I talk to her. Hey, your husband is a normal guy. You have to accept, know him and accept him as it is. Now, imagine, imagine if both of them will listen to this. And she will accept and he will accept. She will accept him and he will accept her. Where is this couple going to be? I tell you, Gan Eden. Gan Eden. Now, imagine if just one of them, only one of them says, all right, I'm going to accept my wife as she is. What is going to happen? Also going to happen. You see, also going to happen. And it takes two to tango, but just one for Shalom Bay. Remember this. And you know what? Many times we we'll criticize, criticize our spouse. Oh, no, no, no. You know what is the best way to interact when... How, how do you challenge? But because I know what you might be thinking. Well, but it means that I cannot tell my husband anything. Of course you can. Of course you should. But there is nothing better if you want to change, improve, let's say, improve your spouse behavior. What is the only way that might work? Inspire him. Inspire her. How do you inspire her? How do you do that? How do you do that? By doing it. You do it. Let's say your wife never says thank you, never says I'm sorry, whatever, okay? Or your, your husband. So you just say I'm sorry. And you say thank you. And he will do it. Hopefully. Because we, we, we tend to imitate each other. Couples tend to imitate each other. There are some experiments, beautiful experiments, that, you know, uh, <coughs> couples, they look alike. Their, their, their faces, they look alike. So they say, oh, yeah, that's a repo, whatever, all right. Now, uh, uh, they found out that they looked alike 
as they were married for more time. You understand? They look more alike. Because you even smile as your wife smiles. Even that. Oh, guys, she smiles the same way. You look in the same way. You, uh, your tool is there. Because we imitate each other. So the power is there. The power is not in the criticism. You had a question, I'm sorry. How do you bring Hashem into that example? That Hashem created us different. Hashem created us different. Enough uh, uh, um, evidence is in the Torah. Two different creations from two different places. And that we are here, we are different by design. Because Hashem wants us to interact. So the difference between my wife and me are the difference that Good for my children. You know, if I if I know how to synergize with my wife. Now, talking about criticism, I want to teach you something very, very important. Uh, not only do not correct, inspire, but can you criticize? Yes, you can criticize, but there is a way to criticize. There's a famous psychologist, his name is Dorman. So he developed a system in, in, in which he sees, he foresees, this is a marriage counselor, he foresees when American couples are going to get divorced. And, and it, it was a very good, um, um, how do you say, uh, a, a very good element that he discovered. What was this element? What was this, that element? And we have to be aware of it. If we detect it in our relationship, then something is missing, something is wrong. The indicator. That indicator was, how do I criticize my spouse? You know what means ad hominem? I don't know if I'm pronouncing the right pronunciation. Ad hominem. No? It's in Latin. Okay. Ad hominem, hominem like om, homo, like person. You can criticize you. Look at this, the action. Shlomo Melech said, This alto hach lech lets penista eka, o hach hacham beyeha beka. When you want to say to someone, you know, don't tell them, oh, you, you, you are, you're stupid. What do you do? You're stupid. Alto hach lets. Don't tell them, you are a clown. What did you do? You're so stupid. Don't say that. Because you're labeling him and you're attacking him. You can say, you know, this is a stupid action. This is a stupid mistake. You, you can talk about the action. But do not label a person. You see the difference? With your children, the same thing. But this is very sensitive with your spouse. So the, the indicator of mm, the, the red light, not yellow, red light, that Dr. Gorman saw in couples that are going down is that they were attacking each other. Ad hominem, they attacked. They were not attacking actions. You know what? This is not a good thing. That's, 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 that's fair game. But not to put, you know, not to attack the person. Clear? So please. Identify if you are getting there and, and just learn how to criticize the action. When you see some, that he's doing something wrong, your son is doing something wrong, you tell him, such a good child, such a good, you are so smart. You know, I don't believe you could do this. Because you are so smart, you praise the person and you criticize the action. Same thing with our wives, same thing with our spouses. All right? So, can you, can you criticize? Can you? Yes. 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 But what? And how? The action. Okay? Listen, if you get this, you will, when you get home, you, you, will, you will have to analyze yourself. And see, you, oh, oh, I see this is my husband. Maybe I have to criticize the action of the person. And you can learn. It's not difficult to learn.
Uh, something very important also to strengthen our marriage. And this is a very important need for women. Very important need for women. Women need time sharing. I know. Time sharing. Am, am I wrong? Women need time sharing. So, you know, according to your possibilities, one night a week, don't go with your daughter. Just go with your wife. Just go just, just, just with her. This is so healthy. Oh, just walk or whatever. But when you go with your wife, you go with your husband, you have to plan what you're going to talk and what you're not going to talk. Just talk about good things. I remember, I don't know how long ago, but one time I was with, with Coti, with my wife, and it was in Bariloche, a very beautiful place in Argentina. And we had to walk, I don't remember why. We had to walk for a long time, like two hours. No. And, and we planned it. We said, let's talk about the good things of our children. Just the good things of them. The good, their good qualities. What do we love? Or the Akoba, or David. Well, I, we play with advantage because, you know, when you have seven, then you can talk for three or four miles. <laughs> but but I, I, I still remember that conversation. It was so amazing. So it's like relationship building, you know? Uh, so even if you don't walk for, for, for four miles, when you, when you go out, and you're with your wife. I just said that. Let's have a. This is what it means to have a quality time. A quality time doesn't mean that we're going to go to a five stars uh, restaurant or the, uh, Zagat, Zagat, uh, the best restaurant, the most expensive. This is not quality time. That, that's good too, but quality time means what we're going to do, what we're going to talk. Okay? Because, you know, we are not used to. Speaking positive language. Speaking positive language. Say, what are the good things that are happening in our lives? You know, how would you end? Many times you go with your wife, and then, because you want the quality time, but you, oh, again, the, the, the arguments, and this, and that, bah. So plan it. And we're going to talk about good things. That's quality time. Okay? And time sharing for women is very important. For men, it's not so much. So it's not that your husband doesn't love you. It's that he thinks that, well, I would we'll go outside, we we'll do many other things. All right? But, guys, very mind for them is very important. You have to see yourself as a team. You are, you are different. Moran gave you different talents, but you are a team. Okay? And the difference is we complement you. All right, now, now I want to talk about something real different. All these things that I just told you is some of the things that we need to do to strengthen our marriage. Okay? But I want to tell you also some things that we need to do to protect our marriage. Especially in these days and time. As I said, you know, ironically, there are some uh, negative consequences in, in a lot of uh, uh, of not having problems. That if you don't have problems and you don't have a share, then the small things, small problems become big problems. By the way, this is the, the, the formula of happiness. Who is a happy person? Whoever can make from big problems, small problems. Who is a miserable person, whoever does from small problems, big problems. Right. Now I want to talk about protecting our marriage. It's very important because we live in America. And America is very good for many things but not so good for other things. And in our days, 
intimacy, sexuality, has become something completely different from what intimacy should be in Judaism. For us, the only place of intimacy, the only place of intimacy is what? Between husband and wife. That's it. It begins there and it ends there. Now, in the media, in TV, in movies, intimacy with this husband and wife maybe is like 5% of all intimacy. Am I wrong? It's like boring intimacy. So there is an exploitation of sexuality with, uh, uh, with financial purposes in mind. Because these things, uh, they sell. And you sell everything through them, you understand? But what happens? What happens is that when we see sexuality in so many different areas, then we get affected by it. We get assimilated. Assimilation slash socialization. Assimilation doesn't mean just to get married with an with, with a person from a different religion. Assimilation begins when we absorb the values that are not our values, non-Jewish values. Are we exposed to those values? A lot. And they shape the way we think. They shape our feelings, they shape, they shape our beliefs. So, we have to keep our values alive. And, and thank Boreola that we have been privileged of being Jewish. And that the Torah is the main source of protecting our marriage. All right? Uh, they might not be the popular thing that the popular guys are doing. Oh, look at the popular guys. Look at the lives of the celebrities. You think they are happy? It's miserable life. Look at, the, look at the life of a good Jewish couple with their children, with their wives, with their families. And compare it with the life of the celebrity. You will see what I'm talking about. So, w w what are the things, you know? A few things. Number one, Tarata Mishpacha. What does it mean, Tarata Mishpacha? What does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? <coughs> Everybody knows, right? It's not just Nida and Mikve. It's not only that. That is absolutely essential to keep attraction alive. I'm not going to talk about this because I know you know, but just, just, just as an introduction to the next thing. It's so important. You know... I hope you understand, I'm not lying to you. Non-Jewish couples, they don't have Tarata Mishpacha. The main attraction between husband and wife is before they get married, a passion, right? Before they get married and in the honeymoon, etc. After that, th that's hundred, that's a hundred. After that, it goes only. Do you know this, right? After it goes only down. Now that is the definition of a miserable couple. That passion goes from here to here. Blah, 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 blah. After five years, less attraction to his wife, and after ten years, less. Am I am I saying something right? Uh, am I dramatizing or saying something subjective? Down, down, down. After 10 years, after 20 years, ah! Ah! And of course, this brings a lot of problems. Because if you don't find your wife attractive because you are with her every time you want, and vice versa, then uh, let's, let's go for some diversity. Right? Baruch Hashem, we have this secret 
that I believe every single couple should do it. Every single human couple should do it. Even if they are not Jewish. That's to keep passion alive. All right? Now, what is important is that, you know, when, when the Jewish husband is not with his wife, it's not just doesn't sleep with his wife. He doesn't have physical contact with his wife. Why? And what is the consequence of that? Do you think that keeping, keeping this barrier, which is another example of having a shem, right? There is perhaps nothing that represents more having a shem as a partner than the time of Nidra. Why am not why we are not getting physically close? Well, we have a shame with us. It's like a, the hedge of roses. Something in, in untang non-tangible. So beautiful. I love you. I'm attracted to you, but still not with you. And not because I don't love you. Okay? And, and that brings, renews the passion. So even if you are you know, five years, ten years, twenty years into your marriage, and your wife is not with you, you want to feel that passion again. And as Rabbi Meir said, it doesn't matter how many years you are married, when she comes back from the mikveh and you have kept the Rabbi Mishpachat, the line, it is like the first time, the same passion. Who in the world has this formula? Who has this incredible formula to protect marriage? You see how blessed we are, how privileged we are. Now, Taranta Mishpacha also, as I explained to you, uh, includes, you know, this physical barrier. And I think that is something that, that we need to keep. We need to keep outside of the, of the couple. All right, that I have to limit my physical contact with people from the other gender. It is not that uh, I can go and, and dance with uh, this lady or with the other lady as if, as if that won't affect my feelings. Because as you know, physicality is like an introduction for other things. Right? So the Torah taught us something very important, extremely important. That ena potrofos la arayot. It means there are no guarantees for, in my own words, no guarantees for testosterone. What does it mean no guarantees for testosterone? That, uh, for example, I'll give you an example. That's the best example I can give you. Can we eat bacon? No. Can we touch bacon? Yes. Do we have to have a physical separation from bacon? No, you cannot touch. Is there any risk that if I touch bacon, I say, oh, I want this bacon. <laughs> right? Touching bacon is not going to make you wanting bacon, but, but the, and, and, and that with, with every other mitzvah. Right? But in this area, this area is different. And it's much more sensitive than eating bacon because it could, it could what? Kill your, kill everything you have. Everything you have is your wife, is your husband. If, if, if that uh, bond is not strong, then there is nothing, no children, nothing if that is destroyed. You destroy your children with, when you destroy yours with your wife. You understand what I'm saying? So, it's very important to have these fences. And the, 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 the Torah taught us, you know, you have to have some fences. Now, and well, that's why it's, I think this is a part of Tarata Mishpacha that we don't realize. Tarata Mishpacha goes beyond my wife and I. Goes in my relationship with other ladies. And with her relationship with other men. All right? 
So we have some fences, very important fences. If, we, if you keep these fences, then not impossible, but very unlikely you will fall. <laughs> because just think about it. Think about you know, infidelity. How many times it happens deliberately, and how many times it could happen like, well, I, I, I didn't realize I, I was falling in love. Do you understand my question? It could happen in this second way, right? Perhaps it happened more, it happens more in this second way than in the first way. So what do we have to do not to fall into that trap? So the first thing Hachamim said, Ihud. Well, first the Torah said, the Torah, no Hachamim said, keep a physical distance from the other gender. Number one. Number two, Hachamim said, Ihud. No, you cannot be isolated with, with, with a woman that is not your wife. You cannot be in a, in, a, in a lock room where the opportunity is there. Can you be in the same room locked with a cheeseburger? Can you? If it's Shabbat, can you be locked in the same room with a hundred dollar bill? Or with your computer. Can you be with your computer locked in the same room on Shabbat? Or oh, said, no, 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 no. There's a terrible temptation that you, you might turn on your computer. Can you? Yes, you can. Because in most things, you can trust yourself. You can trust yourself that you're not going to eat that bacon, you're not going to cheeseburger, you're not going to turn on that computer. They say this in just one area, just one, which is the most sensitive area, because it protects the most important thing in your life. You got it? Kahamin didn't say this to make our lives more complicated. They said this to protect ourselves from ourselves, from falling where we don't want to fall. That's, that's why they are called fences. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to respect those fences. You respect that, very unlikely you will fall. Very unlikely. Almost, almost impossible. Almost impossible. You with me? You, if, you, if you never get to the opportunity to be alone with another woman in a locked room, you say, no, no, I. You leave it open, you do this, you do that, you come here, come there. I, I went to a doctor the other day, and, and he had in his office, have you ever seen this in his office? Same thing, uh, you know, doctor, don't take it in the wrong way, but cannot see you um, uh, unless it's with another person. It doesn't matter today in America, if you're a man, if you're a woman, he wants to see you with two people. Two people. Why they do that? Because they are fences. They're protecting their career, their business, from uh, uh, suing, from uh, false accusations. They're protecting their money or their reputation. Now, the Torah said this a long time ago. A long time ago. Before the lawyers. I remember as a rabbi, uh, a lawyer told us in a group of rabbis, when you see somebody, always leave your door open. Men, woman, whoever it is, just leave your door open. Never lock a room. Never. And if you can, just leave a little bit open. And try that always come with somebody, etc., etc. Okay? So, it is very, very, very important to keep these fences. Because they protect us. Can see? Well, yeah, there are ways, there are ways, there are ways to do it. There are ways to do it. There are cameras or this or that. Or it just, you will find a way. But just, just uh, have it here. Some, some have said, well, when there are cameras, there is no problem. You understand what I'm saying? Because it's a, all right, I can give you details, but the, the important thing is that you understand this concept. And because somebody can fall, you're a woman. Maybe you won't fall, but he will fall. 
involuntarily. So what do you do then? Understand? So if you keep these fences alive, they will protect you. What else? Now, another thing which is extremely important. I want to describe this to you. I, I wrote about this uh, like a couple of weeks ago. In Hebrew, this is called Kerub Hadat. Kerub Hadat. It's a beautiful expression. What does it mean, Kerub Hadat? How would you translate Kerub Hadat? Emotional closeness. You understand what I'm saying? Emotional closeness. So let's talk about the word phrase. Even before we get to Ihud, to mean isolated, secluded, with the person of a different, uh, of the opposite gender. Now listen to this. How do you treat your neighbor? Your neighbor, your next door neighbor, you don't have a lot of uh, relationship with him or with her. So how do you treat every other human creature? What is the most basic element in any relationship with another human being? Thank you, respect. You treat people with respect. If you disrespect people, then, then there is no, nothing, it's nothing. Okay? So first of all, treat everyone, every human being with, eterame, that's respect, with respect. All right? That's number one. Now, when you are friendly with your neighbor, or with uh, your boss, or with uh, somebody that works with you, or for you, or under you, can you go one step above respect, which I would call cordiality? Can you behave with cordiality with somebody of the opposite gender? And my answer is yes, you should. Now, what is cordiality? <laughs> what is cordiality? What does it mean, cordiality? Tell me. What does it mean? Politeness. Politeness. Can we share ideas? Can we share ideas? Can we discuss what we have to do, what we don't have to do? Of course, there is no physical contact. Okay, there is no ihud. Cordiality. Is that fine? Yeah. Can you smile? Or you have to be like... <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Cordiality. Cordiality is good. It's... it's, it's, it's Fabulous. And this is how you should behave. What's the next step? What's the next step? With, with your neighbor, you can be with uh, cordiality. All right? The next step is tubalat. The next step, one level higher, is emotional closeness. How would you define emotional closeness? When it gets personal. Mm. I'm sharing with you my emotions. You know, I'm sharing with you, you, my, uh, my boss, or you, my uh, tennis teacher, I'm sharing with you what is going on between me and my husband. Do you understand what I'm saying? Even if it's not something on the field of intimacy, just so sharing with you that we have problems, blah, 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 whatever it is. That is not sharing ideas. That is not sharing work. That is sharing a very personal information. When you get to that level, then you are, this is a beep, 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 beep. beep. This, is, this is an alarm. This is terrible. Because the next step will be something else. You don't get, listen carefully, you do not get from respect to infidelity. You do not get from cordiality to infidelity. You don't, you just don't. But you do get from emotional closeness to something else. So we need to be 
alert and smart and see because these things again I say it again we don't realize them but the moment I see one second you know I'm, I'm sometimes you share with this lady or with this man more hours than what you share with your husband is that true to me now it's okay if you keep the distance but not just a hood you have to understand where is my relationship with this lady going and whatever it, it is is respect fine cordiality fine but if you detect that at any level she or he or you crosses that line and just go into just dialogue without nothing physical just talking about sharing emotions and personal things Ooh. it's time to put a stop you see the Torah taught us the traditionalistic that, that in certain areas we cannot just trust our judgment we cannot just trust ourselves because this is something very powerful alright so the only way or the Jewish way to deal with it is to establish and to respect certain fences, certain boundaries if we respect these boundaries, very unlikely that, this, that it will fall. The same way that I tell you, if, if the cliff is there, and I put the fence here, and I respect this fence, I'm not going to fall. What is the, if I respect the fence here, what is the possibility I will uh, uh, fall there? I will fall there, all right, in that cliff, if there is no fence, and stupidly I take a selfie. I, I go nearest to the cliff because the, the, the view is magnificent. And I trust myself, ah, ah, boom. I, I, by the way, it happens many times. It happens. Unfortunately, people die because of this. But if there is a strong, strong fence here, and I respect that fence, am I at any danger of falling in the cliff? Am I? No. Because I respect the fence. Just know these fences and respect them. Because we need to protect our boundaries. Don't forget, we live in America. In America, they don't believe in these fences. They don't have these fences. That's why there are so many problems. There are so many things. We can assimilate in certain things. Yes, I use a tie. This is not Jewish. This is, really, this is not Jewish. This is not the Jewish thing. It's not the CC. It's not, but you know what? I'm assimilated. To, to America. But this is an okay assimilation to America. Okay? But there are certain other things that are not. That we should say, oof. If I assimilate, if I don't keep my own values, whoa, 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 whoa. It's very dangerous. All right? So, do you see why I said that the beginning and the end of this lecture is to realize that we are not two, we are three. Mori Olam taught us to establish fences. Hachamim took it one step over because they knew that this would happen. Um, I'm going to read to you, and we, I will finish with it, because I, I, I want this to be very clear. I wrote this, so I can read it, right? Uh, but I, I want to read this to you. Good relationships between human beings begin with respect. I cannot relate to someone, to my neighbor, for example, if he does not respect me, or, for, or if I do not respect him or her. Respect is the most primary requirement of every human relationship. Then, when that relationship grows a little more, we would, like to, we would be talking about cordiality, which is one level of respect. 
In a relationship based on cordiality, there is a positive communication between the two people, a good understanding, and a healthy exchange of ideas. Then the relationship can reach the next level. This is where the yellow or red light should be on. And this is where Hachamim taught us to be very careful. The next level is the level of emotional trust. I confide in you. It's like, you know, a little bit like friendship, but friendship at that level with the other gender is not recommendable at all. Or emotional closeness. In Hebrew, Kirubada. In a relationship of cordiality, idea, ideas and thoughts are exchanged. But in a emotional, in a relationship of, of emotions, emotional trust, feelings, secrets, are more, more private information is exchanged. This relationship, which might not necessarily have to do with sexuality at the beginning, is a more intimate relationship. It has to do with Keruba Dad, what word are you hearing here? Dad. How the Torah describe the first time men and women were together? Dad. Adam Yadad Havaishto. This is like the prelude? Prelude? How do you say? Prelude to intimacy. What brings people to intimacy? Emotional closeness. So what am I doing? I'm getting emotional close to somebody from the opposite gender. You understand? All right. So I think as long as we have this in mind, have in mind that we have to strengthen our relationship with our spouse, understand how I should be in mind, accept, be more informed, criticize not the person but the action, and watch ourselves. Keep Nida Tata Mishpacha at home and outside home. First fence. Keep Ihud. Second fence. And keep a very clear mind of where is my level of friendship with, with this lady or this man. I think we can only grow. And I hope and pray to Boy Olam, he will inspire us. And all of us will find Shalom Bait. And, uh, and not only Shalom Bait, but also happiness. Because the main source of happiness in one's life is relation with his wife, and with his spouse, and with his family. With that, you have everything. Without that, we have nothing. Thank you very much. <laughs>